Okay, welcome to video 3.2. We're going to talk about vector differentiation. Um, I want to look at an example. So what I have here is a drawing of a gimbal. Let me move this to the right just a bit. So I've got some reference frame A here in green that you can imagine as the wall or some fixed wall. And then um, I have an outer frame B, the black rectangle, that rotates relative to the wall through angle theta about AZ. And then inside of that frame is the blue C frame that rotates relative to B through angle beta about the CX axis. And then finally, we have a disk D that rotates about the DZ axis with respect to C through angle alpha. And finally, there's two points on the disk, P and Q. Um, and P and Q, the distance between them we uh, represent with the vector r and the r has a length l and if the video gets noisy i apologize we are in the early stages of storm eunice and uh, the wind is howling at the door so hopefully that's not too bad but we have this basic thing you can call this a gimbal um, and gimbals are used in a number of different devices uh, you'll probably come across them um, uh, in, in, in different contexts, but uh, this is a, a, a classic system that lets us orient uh, these four reference frames, and then we have this vector r that we're going to be concerned with, okay? So the first thing I want to think about here is um, if we observe this vector r while we are standing on A, B, C, or D, um, we can determine which of these scalar variables, theta, beta, alpha, or L, um, would cause R to change if we changed one of those variables. Right? So let's just make a little table. And um, I'm going to put the reference frame A, B, C, and D. And then um, we have these four variables. Here too. So we can check whether each variable um, will cause R to change if observed from the different reference frames. So starting with a D, uh, it may be the easiest. If I'm standing on the disk D and I'm looking at R, well, um, R rotates with me, so the orientation of R is not going to change. Um, alpha is uh, not going to be relevant because I'm also spinning with, al with alpha in that case. But if I'm watching this vector and L changed, right, the length of this vector change, that would be observable to me. So if I'm standing on D, um, none of the variables except L will cause R to change when I'm observing from L, okay? And we can step back on each frame if I'm now standing on C and I'm watching R. Well, now alpha matters, right? Because alpha will change the direction of R relative to my perspective. But theta and beta doesn't matter because I'm standing on C. Even if theta changes, I am still um, observing only changes due to R and L. So alpha, I'm sorry, alpha and L, but uh, theta and beta wouldn't matter. Similarly, now I stand on frame B, well, beta matters, all right? That's going to cause R to change, so it's beta, alpha, and L all matter. And then finally, if I'm standing on A, then all of the variables could possibly cause R to change. One thing that I often do when trying to visualize this, if you imagine um, 
all of the variables but the one in question uh, set to zero. All right, so if I set beta to zero, then C is aligned with B. If I set alpha to zero, then uh, D is aligned with C and B. And then if I um, set L to zero, well, L, uh, R wouldn't have any uh, length, but let's call L constant, it's fixed. And then if I move uh, theta while I'm standing on A, then I would see some change potentially in um, R. The orientation of R would then be pointing in the same direction as BX in that case. All right. So in general, you can think about which frame you're observing from, and you determine which of these scalar variables will, um, if they change, would affect any change that you see in the vector r. So this is going to play a role in when we are determining um, how to take derivatives of the vectors with respect to any given variable. All right, so we're going to talk about vector differentiation. In this regard, so um, if I write that vector r, the easiest way to write it is l d x. Right, we can see in the, the x direction we have uh, this vector, and we already know that we can express this in the different reference frames, um, and we'll do that. But we're going to be interested in the partial derivative of r with respect to various scalar variables. So let me just pick theta as one of the scalar variables there. So does r change with respect to theta? Well, if we come back up to our table, it does change with respect to theta, but only in one reference frame. So it doesn't always change with respect to theta. So we have to include which reference frame we're observing from when we take a derivative. So if I want to see how R changes with respect to theta, I better know what reference frame that um, uh, is with respect to. Okay, so derivatives, vectors of the derivatives, we have to know which reference frame. So this means uh, what I've written, this partial derivative. If you want to write it out in words, we'll say it's the partial derivative of R when observed from reference frame A with respect to theta, the variable theta. Yeah. So that's a basic partial derivative um, terminology that we will use. Now let's take um, R and we know that we could express R in the reference frame A, right? So if I want to take the partial derivative with respect to A, then I can express R in it, A. Right. So these um, scalars, A1, 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 A2, and A3, there's some function of theta, beta, alpha, and L, potentially. Right? We would call these scalars the measure numbers for each component of R. So I'm going to call this the AX, or I can just call it the X component of R. Right? And then similarly, the scalar value associated with the component, we're going to name those the measure number. Um, of, in this case, the Z component of R. Z component of R. Okay, so the component we have three components, and then each of the components have a measure number associated with them. 
And um, when I express R in the A frame, we know then that AX hat, a -X, a Y hat, and A Z hat are all fixed in A. So if I'm standing in A and I'm watching these uh, mutually perpendicular unit vectors, we've already defined that they're fixed in A. So they do not change. So if we know they don't change, then if we then try to take the partial derivative when observed from A with respect to um, theta, and we know that A1, A2, and A3 are potentially functions of theta, then we need to take the partial of the measure number with respect to theta times the AX component, which does not change. And we end up with being able to calculate our partial derivative by only taking these partial derivatives of the measure numbers in the A-frame. Okay. So, if we express the vector in the frame of interest that we want to observe from, we can then take the partial derivative by taking partial derivatives of the measure numbers for that vector. And this works because AX, AY, and AZ unit vectors are fixed in A. This implies that if I just write the partial of R with respect to theta, and I do not include any reference frame, um, then this is meaningless. Okay, so super important. We have to make sure we know which frame we are taking and observing any change of any given vector. So another thing, uh, we just did partial derivatives with respect to these um, variables theta, beta, alpha, uh, and L, but we're going to have the case most often that uh, variables like these are also uh, functions, uh, implicit functions of time. So if these variables are all themselves functions of time, and that would mean then Right, theta is some function of time, beta some function of time, alpha some function of time, and then L some function of time. We now have um, everything as a function of a single variable, T. Right? And so, um, our vector r is now a function of this single variable t, and if we express it in the A-frame, just like we did before, then our measure numbers a1, a2, and a3 all are some arbitrary functions of time. But they are going to be also made up of expressions uh, that contain theta, beta, alpha, and L. Um, if we only have a single variable, then we can take the ordinary derivative. So the derivative of R with respect to T. In A, we need a reference frame. Um, 
would then be, would then be the ordinary derivatives of a1 with respect to t, and the ax direction, and so on. So anytime we'll be taking lots of times derivatives in this class um, and we're going to use the uh, dot notation more often. So I would write R with a single dot for a single <laughs> excuse me, a single derivative, R dot NA equals A1 dot AX plus A2 dot AY plus a3 dot a c. All right. So we have a single variable. Uh, we can take the ordinary derivative and uh, we can also write it with this dot notation as long as we express it in the reference frame um, that we want to observe the change in. Right? We can then take just the derivatives of the scalar uh, measure numbers. Okay. So, um, seems straightforward. We express vectors in the representative interest. We take these partial derivatives. Um, but um, the measure numbers are often going to be expressions of theta, beta, alpha, and L, right? These, these variables that are implicit in time. So, we want to think about that too. So, when the measure numbers are these expressions containing implicit functions of time right for example theta of t in our case, then the chain rule has to be applied. Okay, so what does that look like if I have the um, if I have some vector, vector uh, we'll stick with R, right? And I'm taking this time derivative with respect to uh, T. And we know that uh, A1, A2, and A3, that these like expressions that are made up of uh, different functions of things like theta, theta of T, L of T, alpha of t, beta of t, then you can use the chain rule and calculate the partial of r, write that better, of r with respect to the variable of interest, uh, to one of the variables that are in the expressions in the a-frame, and then using the chain rule, then we have to say uh, times d theta dt. And then for every variable, we have to add a component. So for ours, we have uh, four variables. Um, beta, d beta, dt, that's an A, plus the partial of R in A for alpha, and then the alpha dt, and finally the partial in a of r with respect to l times dl dt. Right? So this um, would be the chain rule and apply to each of the variables that are present, these implicit functions of time. And then we can take the derivatives like this. So we can take the partials like we've done earlier, and then we just uh, have to take the time derivative of each, each variable. Okay. There's one more part that's potentially part of this, 
So if you have any explicit expressions of time, any if time is explicit and not uh, implicit like this theta of t, then you also have to take the partial of the vector r with respect to the variable t explicitly right, for that piece there. Uh, so this is if t is explicit in the expressions. All right. So we can calculate uh, the time derivative where measure numbers are made up of implicit functions of time uh, using this formula here. All right, the last thing that I want to say, and then we'll jump over to look over, look at Jupiter and try some of these things out. Um, you're also going to take second and higher derivatives in the class. And there's an important thing to uh, note, and that is, if I have the partial of R, and I'll just pick a new variable X in some reference frame A, and then I take the partial of that with respect to some other variable R in a different reference frame, then that does not necessarily equate to taking the partial of R with respect to y in the B frame. And then taking the partial with respect to x in the A frame. Right? So um, you're not guaranteed to get uh, equal second partial derivatives or, or higher in that case. And um, the uh, uh, sometimes this can be the case, it can be true, right? If A is equal to B, then these second partials uh, do commute and you would have an equal sign here. But if, uh, if they aren't the same reference frame, then they're not necessarily equal. They can be, but they're not necessarily. And you need to be aware of that when you take your derivative so you don't uh, um, make a mistake. Um, we will, I'm going to look at and Jupiter, though, will make the will make these calculations um, with SymPy. If I take the gimbal example and I do a, an explicit t times a y is vector q, we're going to calculate then um, the partial of q with respect to t in c. And then we're going to take the, um, and not the partial, the ordinary derivative, since we only have we we'll have one variable in this case, and then take it in b. And we're going to see what that comes out to be, and then we will also um, do the part, the uh, derivative with respect to t and b. All right, and then c. And notice that I'm taking the derivative here with respect to the same variable in both t and t, uh, but I do the frames in the opposite order. And we're going to see whether or not these come out to be equal or not uh, over in Jupiter. OK, so those are the basic notes for um, this. Let's do a few things in Jupiter. with SymPy. All right, I'm going to create a new Python file here and it'd be nice to load, load that picture from the gimbal. Mm, but I think it'll take me a little bit of time, so I'll just switch back to it when I need to. Let me open it over here so we can see the gimbal. All right, so let me just remind you of the gimbal. Right, so we uh, have A, frames A, B, C, and D. We rotate 
um, B with respect to A about Z through theta, and then C with respect to B about X through beta, and D with respect to C about Z through alpha. All right. So we're going to set this uh, system up, and we're going to take a few derivatives. All right. Let's name this. Uh, differentiation if I can spell it differentiation still can't spell it finally all right we save that notebook so let's import simpy And I'm going to use um, init. Dot, I'm going to use me. Dot init. Dot v printing, and I showed this in the notes. This is actually going to let us get dot notation for the time derivatives, so our expressions look a little simpler uh, since it uh, takes up less space to write the dot than the d dt. And then uh, let's create the symbols we need. We need a theta, a beta, an alpha, and an l. And uh, also in the notes, I introduced dynamic symbols, right? So this automatically will create implicit functions of time for us for these variables. Beta, alpha, and L. So each of these variables are implicitly a function of time. And then we need reference frames A, B, C, and D. And then I'll use sm.symbols and use my trick I showed you earlier, a um, b, b c d. And then we can say class equals any dot reference frame. Yep. Okay, so we have the basic variables that we need. Let's set up the orientations. B dot orient axis with respect to A. And that is uh, through theta about the z axis. So we'll do theta a dot z. And then we'll do um, uh, c dot orient axis with respect to b. And that's going to be through angle of beta. But the way I've drawn it too, it's, um, it's actually about the negative z axis. I don't have a positive right hand rule, so I'm sorry, negative uh, b. X. So it's about the x, but I need that negative there as I've defined it in my picture. And then uh, d dot orient axis. With respect to c um, through alpha, and then this is a positive rotation about the common z axis. So that should give us our orientations for this example. And then we know that we have this vector r, which is l times d in the x direction right. and we can express that in any frame we want now with uh, these tools so if i uh, just uh, step back d c right r express b r dot express in a right. so those uh, are as vector r expressed in each of the reference frames. So if I want to take the time derivative, I'm sorry, if I want to take the partial derivative of any of the variables, theta, beta, alpha, l, um, I have to do that with respect to observing it from a specific reference frame. So if we take um, r express c, I can then dot with, um, well, I don't, actually I don't need the express. If I dot r, with cx, I get the measure number in cx, right? And then if I take a diff with respect to alpha, I have that derivative, right? So I can do r dot c dot y. That's another component that we see there. And then I also take the derivative with respect to alpha. So to make um, R with respect to alpha and A, 
So I'll just type R with respect to alpha and A. Um, then we do R dot C dot X if alpha times A dot um, sorry in C I'm saying that wrong we're, we're trying to get in the C frame uh, there we go C dot X and then plus R dot C dot Y diff with respect to alpha times C dot Y R would take the derivative of R with respect to alpha and viewed from C and that should give us our partial derivative properly. So we've, we've uh, gotten the measure numbers in the C frame, taking the scalar derivative with respect to alpha, and then reconstructed that variable. Right? And um, you can do that process, but there each vector also has a diff function or, or a diff method that associated with it. So if I take the um, R and I take the derivative with respect to alpha in the C frame doesn't quite give me the same answer right it's looking similar it's in the dy so if I re-express that in C let's see if it gives us the same answer we got on our own um, still a little complicated let's try to simplify and there we go so it is in fact the same thing but the diff function here um, actually tries to re-express it back in the original vector form that we have so that's why it took the expression and simplified to, to get back to what we produced manually all right but they are the same and you can take a derivative and it's mathematically equivalent and if you need to make it shorter or express it in a different frame you can do so okay so that's how you take the partial derivatives um, of a vector in a specific frame in SymPy. Now, we know too that we've made these uh, variables theta, beta, alpha, and L, theta, beta, alpha, and L, um, functions of time. But they don't show up that way when I print them. That's because by default um, it doesn't show the parentheses t if I use this init v printing. But if I take a diff, um, and first let's grab t. So this is the best way to get the t variable because it, so that you ensure that we're always using the same variable. You can get it from me dynamic symbols dot underscore t. So then I can take that theta variable and diff respect to t and I get a theta dot there right so it's going to give me this dot notation and we take those kind of derivatives so now um, we can also take the time we know that all of these things in R are functions of time L theta beta alpha and L and, uh, and L so we can take the time derivative so if I take R and I take the different the derivative with respect to time and I can pick um, whatever reference frame I want to observe in let's just do D I get L dot DX right? so if I'm standing on the disk and looking at that vector only the length of it would change when viewed from that but if I take the time derivative with respect to A Right, we're going to get a much more interesting expression. Right, so that time derivative is quite a bit more nasty. Quite a bit nasty. It's expressed here in the D frame since that's what we we've started with. We could try to simplify some of you know these kind of things start to take a little longer to simplify, and at some point it's not really worth doing, and we'll talk about that more. But that's not bad. So it really chopped it down. We've got it in a simple form, but that's the time derivative when viewed from A of the vector R. And we see um, all these terms in there: thetas, betas, alphas, theta dots, alpha dots, 
and the LDOT term there. So that is taking the time derivative. Vectors also just have a dt, so you don't have to type the t at all. If I just type dt of a, I get the same thing. And notice that came out um, much more simplified. So there's a little more smarts in here to uh, give you a little bit simpler version than what we did with just the, the diff. So you can take the time derivative in a reference frame uh, just like so. All right. So uh, that are the main time derivatives. And let's look at this last piece, which is going to be this um, second derivative and whether or not these, uh, if I take the derivative, what order I take the two derivatives in from different reference frames is going to matter. So I'm going to create this vector q that I mentioned in the notes earlier. I'm going to do two, uh, t times a dot y as this vector q. All right. So that's a vector. It uh, exists, and we can take its time derivative with respect to variables that we have introduced. We'll do time in this case, and uh, we know that a frames A, I'm sorry, frames um, B and C are, did I write that wrong? Um, I think I wrote in the notes C instead of A, so we're going to do this with respect to A. All right, so what I'll do is um, first take the time derivative with respect to A. And then immediately take the time derivative with respect to b in that order. And then I'll take the time derivative with respect to b and the time derivative with respect to a. And notice I get different results there. Right? So the time derivatives, uh, when you take a second and higher order time derivatives, um, the order of the reference frames does in fact matter and um, and you need to keep that in mind so you can't they're not going to commute and you uh, don't want to assume they do and then make an error with that all right so that is today's uh, last a bit about the vector differentiation. Uh, have a look at the notes. Try uh, calculating some derivatives in your homework. And um, that's all.